Oh, heck yeah. A box with my name on it and even my YouTube name. That means only one thing. Someone has sent me something cool. Oh, heck yeah. This is a Northern Telecom 500 telephone set. It was made in 1981, rather late for a rotary phone. And this was sent to me by a friend of the channel, YouTube user BBC600, Alistair. Uh, it's his phone. Um, he's not giving it to me, but he has lent it to me to try repairing. This phone does have a couple of issues. And in this video, we're going to check this phone out, and we're going to test it, and we're going to hopefully repair it. I'm pretty confident I can fix all this phone's issues. Before we dig into the phone, let's take a look at the letter that he wrote me. To me, of what was NBTEL territory. Oh, NBTEL, with your awesome logo and your wonderful service. And then Bell took over. Greetings from Sasktel Territory. Thanks for agreeing to tinker with my telephone. I do hope you are successful. Phone rings. The phone dials. You can hear the caller on the receiver. But any conversation is solely one way as the phone does not transmit. So there's something going on with the microphone in the receiver. Or the wiring to the microphone. So you can hear the other person, but they can't hear you. So that's the main problem with this thing. There's a couple of other issues, but they're only cosmetic. Um, as you can see, the wiring uh, going into the receiver is quite tattered. And even though this phone was made well into the era when phones started using modular jacks to connect the handset and the phone, uh, this one does not. The handset is actually hardwired to the phone. And it's got a line cord here, which is hardwired to the phone. But it does have an RJ11 jack on the other end. And the last thing I'm going to do, once we fix all the other issues with this phone, is I'm going to put a new RJ11 jack on for him. Because this one has the tab broken off. So that'll be quick and easy to do. I have a crimping tool. So this is a Northern Telecom Model 500. If you're into vintage telephones, you may have heard of the Western Electric Model 500, which was one of the standard phones issued by the Bell Telephone System in the United States from the 1940s or 50s through to the 1980s. And at the time this phone was manufactured, Bell Canada and the American Bell System were in bed with each other and they were allowed to manufacture each other's designs. So Northern Telecom made a copy of the Western Electric Model 500, but they made it themselves. This phone was made in Canada, which is really cool. And this sort of sharing of manufacturing and design between uh, Western Electric and Northern Telecom ended in the mid-1980s, once the Bell system in the United States divested and became AT&T. Once that happened, AT&T sort of became more private and they were like, yeah, we can't see each other anymore, Bell Canada, sorry. And then from then on, Western Electric and Northern Telecom designed their own phones independently. And that spelled the end of the manufacture of phones like this one. So I've never shown a rotary phone on this channel before. I've never even owned one before. This is actually my first time ever using one. Although, I did buy myself one for Christmas. And not to brag, it's way cooler than this one. It's a Western Electric one. It's a different model, uh, different color, way cool color. Um, and once, yeah, I've, I've given that to mom to wrap up for Christmas. I bought it on eBay for way too much money because it's in beautiful shape. Um, and it's one of the more rare colors, but once Christmas comes and I get that, I'll make a video of that, and that should be pretty cool too. But this is my first time ever uh, being hands-on with a rotary phone. And it's kind of funny, you know, it seems these days, of course, it started with millennials. Uh, now it's the Gen Z that people make fun of. It seems all over the internet, or even on some TV shows, 
uh, they always put a rotary phone in, in front of some young person and they're like, her, her, dial a number on this and the kid just has no idea what to do. Um, I don't know if they're faking it or if people or if young people really can't figure this out anymore. But it's obviously very easy. Each hole is marked with the numbers. You stick your finger in the number that you want to dial, bring it all the way to the metal stop and let go. And it dials that number. No star, no pound. Uh, they weren't invented yet, basically. Um, Western Electric and Northern Telecom uh, did later introduce a uh, uh, touch-tone version of this phone, the Model 1500, which still didn't have star or pound, and then uh, later still they introduced the 2500, which had the star and pound. And this is kind of nostalgic for me because the very first electronic device I ever uh, disassembled and saw the insides of as a toddler, like three, four years old, was a Northern Telecom 2500 telephone. My dad and I took it apart together. I still remember it to this day, clear as day. We completely disassembled it. We didn't put it back together. It was thrown away after that, which is too bad because it was a perfect working phone, but holy cow, that was magic seeing, you know, what was inside one of these for the first time. And uh, after that, I never touched a phone like this again until now. Even though this is a 500 and not a 2500, it still, uh, it still uh, sort of recalls that old, old memory for me, which is kind of nice. So you got the label in the middle of the dial where you could write your own phone number or an emergency number or whatever. This one's been unadulterated, which is kind of surprising. Either that or it's a new one or it's been flipped around or something. We have the receiver. Everything's very chunky, very solid feeling, really thick plastic. There you can see Northern Telecom. Ratty wiring. Look around the back here. Northern Telecom. Patented 1968 and 1970. And then on the bottom, bottom's made of metal. The entire inside of the phone's made of metal, which is why these things never break. But if we look here, it says, Made in Canada. And it's got a date code. There's date codes everywhere on this. Uh, here's one of them, 81, 1981. Uh, and there's date codes on other places too. That dial adjusts the ringer volume. Of course, this thing has an electromechanical bell ringer. And uh, turning this dial, basically, I think it adjusts the uh, distance between the hammer that strikes the bell and the bell itself. I'm going to turn that all the way down to the quietest setting so that when we test this later, it, there's a less chance of it scaring the crap out of me when it rings. The uh, case is kind of loose. I think that's just these two screws right here that are loose. I don't know if they came loose at shipping or if he pre-loosened them for me or what. So there you go. Well, you know what we got to do now. We got to plug this thing in and assess the functionality of the unit for ourselves. Make sure it can dial, make sure it can ring. And we'll see what the situation is with being able to hear uh, called parties and other parties being able to hear us. Let's, let me plug this thing in and we'll find out. Alright, the phone is plugged into the line. Let me pick it up here and see if I can hear a dial tone. Loud and clear. Okay, so the earpiece indeed works fine. Let's call the uh, U.S. Naval Observatory time number, the number that you can call that gives you the time. Uh,
I think I have pulse dial enabled on my... Oh, it's ringing. It's ringing. Okay, I got a message saying no transfer numbers have been set. And then a busy signal, which I recall uh, the last time I tried to call this number, uh, that that's what happened. Actually, I'm going to try another number. Uh, there's a number you can call, a local number for Environment Canada that gives you the weather forecast. It's ringing. Oh, I got it. It's going to ask me to press a number. Let's see if it uh, supports pulse dialing. Oh, it does. Four for my area. It works. Severe weather bulletin for New Brunswick at three. Atlantic Standard Time, Monday, November 30th, 2020. A rainfall warning is continued. Sounds great. That's awesome. All right. Uh, well, you know what we got to do now? Uh, we got to dial this thing in here at ring and see how far I jump. So I've got this phone connected to my secondary landline, which I got a couple of months ago. Uh, the number is public. I give it out because it's primarily hooked up to a fax machine and I encourage anybody to send me a fax if you want to. It's an American number. 207-952-8919. Uh, so let me dial that on my cell phone here. 207-952-8919. Oh. Uh. Oh, the fax machine picked up. Poop. Uh, that all, that sounded really pathetic, and I just remembered that my, my voice over IP adapter, you can set uh, the ringing power on it, uh, low or high, and it defaults to low. I might have to set it to high to make this thing ring. Low is such low voltage that it won't even trigger a neon lamp on telephones that have a neon lamp to indicate ringing. So low power might not be enough for this, but let me uh, configure the fax machine so it doesn't answer, and uh, then we'll we'll ring this thing again. All right, let's try that again. I set the answering or I set the fax machine to uh, not answer automatically. <laughs> it's not even hitting both bells. Oh, that's adorable. It's not very loud. <laughs> Funny. Now, let me put my cell phone on speakerphone. Nope, nothing. No transmit. Um, let me go, uh, log into my uh, uh, VoIP adapter and set the ringing power to high just so we can hear this thing uh, with a proper ring voltage. Alright, I set the ring power to high, which is equivalent to what a proper landline ring voltage would be. I don't know why it defaults to a reduced ring voltage that won't work for all phones. But let's call it again. See if we get a proper ring. No, it's not hitting both bells. I wonder if that's the uh, volume thing that's doing that. There we go. That's both bells. Okay, so I probably didn't actually have to set it to high ring power. The uh, 
uh, uh, volume wheel actually prevents it from hitting both bells. It only hits one bell, so it sounds like a, a princess phone or a trim line phone. That's neat. I didn't know that. All right, so let's get to figuring out why this thing can't transmit. I am betting that it's a broken wire somewhere. So we gotta get the wiring out of the handset. And how you do that is, on these old phones, the uh, uh, both ends of the handset actually unscrew. So if I unscrew the uh, receiver here, there's the receiver. Ain't that cool? Look at that, made of metal. So that's the receiver, and it's got two wires going to it. It's got what appears to be a diode going to it too, so if the, if, it, if the receiver wasn't working and the wiring tested fine, I would suspect that diode. But being serviceable as these were, it's just two spade connectors holding it in there, so I can pull those out. Just like so. And there's a receiver and I can set that aside. There's a little wad of cotton in there. I assume to dampen resonance or something. Now we'll unscrew the uh, microphone part. And the microphone will actually fall right out. It's not connected through wires. Here's the microphone and let me listen. I'm shaking the microphone up to my ear to hear if I can uh, to see if I can hear rattling inside it, which I'm not sure if I do or don't. I'm not really sure what it sounds like. Early telephone microphones were carbon microphones, so how they worked was they had carbon in between two electrodes. And when you spoke, your voice, the sound from your voice, made the carbon granules inside the microphone vibrate. And the vibration of the carbon granules caused the uh, uh, electrical signal passing through the microphone to modulate and that's how you uh, modulated sound. So this might or might not be a carbon microphone. Earlier examples of this phone it would definitely be a carbon microphone but this one being from 1981 it might just be a dynamic microphone but I'm not sure. It does say patent 1955 made in Canada and it's got a date code 1981 so there's the uh, microphone and the uh, actually the microphone on the back has two metal concentric rings which uh, press against these contacts when it's screwed in and these contact this uh, plastic cup holding the contacts falls out and then you have two more spade connectors, these ones screwed in, uh, holding that together. So I've got a screwdriver here, I just have to disconnect these spade connectors. There we go. So now what I should be able to do is, and I'm going to switch to manual focus because this thing doesn't know where it wants to focus. I'm going to pull the uh, rubber sheath out here and the wires are going to come all with it. And there you go. We have an empty handset enclosure, the bare wires which go into the telephone, two for the uh, microphone, two for the earphone or earpiece. I'm not sure yet but I may have found our microphone problem already. I found a couple of places on the red wire where the insulation has been compromised so the wire might actually be broken in those spots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the enclosure of the telephone. I've got a multimeter and we're going to check the resistance between the two microphone wires and see if there is continuity between both of them or if one or both of them might be broken. Let's find out. Okay, let's crack this thing open. 
two flathead screws on the bottom, and I think that might be it. There you go. Let's take a look at this thing. There's what the inside of one of these beasts look like. There's the bell mechanism. So how the volume control actually works is that it rotates this bell. So on the loudest setting, the bell is farther away slightly. And there's a little hammer that the ringing voltage uh, moves through this coil. Acts as a solenoid. It's able to hit both bells. But when it's set all the way to the quietest setting, this wire keeps getting in the way. It was actually uh, trapped in there, this red wire. So I got that out of the way. Um, with the bell volume all the way to the quietest setting, the hammer doesn't move enough. Like it can't move back to spring back and hit the uh, high pitch bell. So it only hits the low pitch bell. But when I move it to a louder setting, it's able to hit both bells. So what I've got to do now is find out in this rat's nest of wiring, but look at that, spade terminals even on the inside. These things were meant to be very serviceable. Now i got to find out which wires in this rat's nest go to the microphone. Okay, I think I found what wires are what. So, I got my multimeter here. Do a test, yes it works. Let me, uh, just for a sanity check, we'll test the uh, earpiece wires first. I trace those as well. Okay, so that earpiece wire checks out, 3.2 ohms. That seems reasonable given the length and uh, gauge of the wire. Let's test the other one here. 3.7 ohms, yeah, so the earpiece uh, wires check out as our sanity test. So I'll clip the black microphone wire here and it's 3.0 ohms, so that works. Now let me clip the uh, red one which goes right here. Ta-da! Open circuit! We have a dead mouthpiece wire, that red wire. Okay. So now we have to do the hard part. Uh, because, of course, this wire goes all through this spiral cord, I can't really just run a new wire. I could replace this entire spiral cord, but I'd like to not have to do that if I don't have to. Um, I'd like to keep the original cord. I'm sure Alistair would appreciate not having to have the cord replaced because the cord is in really good shape. Um, so what I might see, to, what I might try to do is see if. Um, where I saw the compromised insulation on the wire, if it's if that's where the wire is broken, that'll work because I can just solder a new wire onto that because it's already outside of the white coiled part, so that'll be perfect, and uh, I can make that work. So I'm going to probe around, see if I can determine where exactly the wire is broken. Well, I found the issue. It is. That split in the wire, in the red wire right there, the uh, actual wire is broken at that point. So I might not actually have to run a new wire. I think I've got enough length on either end that I can just cut it here, strip each end, and solder it back together and, and, and uh, uh, wrap it with uh, some heat shrink tubing. And that should be okay. So I'm going to give that a shot. 
it'll be a little tricky. These are really fine, delicate wire with 40-year-old uh, rubber insulation on them, but I'll give it my all. Here's the uh, hook switch right here, and you can see there's this multi-pole reed switch that it activates. It is a few days later. Uh, this thing gave me an unexpectedly hard time uh, repairing it. <laughs> it must have heard me get cocky saying that I was, uh, I was going to be able to fix it no problem. Yeah, it was extremely difficult. Um, as it turns out, and this isn't a huge surprise, the wires inside this cord are so fine. They're so delicate and so fine that it's very difficult to solder uh, to them and well I'll give you the play-by-play -play. I cut off the bad part of the one microphone wire that didn't have continuity went to solder uh, the two ends together and when I tested it still no microphone it turned out that the black wire had broken. My fiddling with the red wire to get it soldered together caused the black, a uh, weak part of the black wire to break. So I had to do the whole thing and solder that back. Then when I tested it, I had no uh, earpiece sound. One of the earpiece wires had broken. So I fixed that and I tested it again and I didn't, uh, and I once again didn't have earpiece sound. All four wires in this handset cord broke. Every time I fixed one, the next one broke. That's how fine and delicate these wires are. It was so frustrating. <laughs> but uh, I got it working, and as you can see, what I ended up doing was... I basically just lopped off, just because I was having such a hard time soldering. I lopped off uh, a couple of inches off the uh, cord and that exposed some slightly fresher copper that I was able to marginally solder to. The wire was so bad it taken to solder I didn't think it was even copper. I thought it was some copper coated steel but I, I think it is copper but it's just so thin that uh, uh, it can't I guess probably because it can't hold any heat <laughs> and so solder doesn't take to it. I tried flux and everything but I managed to get it working, and as of now, uh, everything is working. We do have transmit sound. The microphone uh, works fine. And as you can see, uh, the cord is shoved right into the handset, right up to the curly part. So we don't have the little straight part anymore, which is too bad. But I saved the original cord. Didn't have to try a different cord. And... Uh, I, I'm not going to show it because I do not want to uh, disturb anything now because it's really delicate. But if I were to unscrew this and take out the microphone, you would find that under the plastic cup is all the, all four of those wires all bunched up in there. Um, and then I put a dab of hot glue in there to serve as strain relief so that everything holds together and hopefully doesn't break again. So the last thing I'm going to do is put a new RJ11 jack on the end of this line cord because the tab is broken off it. I know that'll be easy to do so let's go ahead and do that. I've done this a lot. Modular jacks are just horrific for breaking the tabs all the time and well it's not their fault. If you're pulling one out of a out of out from behind a desk or something and the tab catches on something well away it goes so this is a modular jack crimping kit that I bought on Amazon quite a while back for like 15 bucks and it's fantastic it does telephone jacks ethernet jacks um, uh, even modular handset jacks, because they're the smaller type, they're smaller than RJ11, they're RJ9, I think, or RJ10. I had to buy all the connectors, 
separately. I got bags of them here, but they're cheap as well. So, we begin by just, first of all, make a note of the color code, yellow, green, red, black, just in case it was something non-standard. Lop that off, strip it down, like that. Get out our RJ11 jack. Oh, look at that. I, I cut the insulation off perfect. That doesn't happen very often. And stick it in the 6P section. Give her a squeeze, and we're done. Brand new. RJ11 jack. Ta-da! Well, now that this thing is working as it should, uh, let's give it a test uh, and see what the sound quality is actually like coming from a phone like this. Well, that's pretty much all there is to show with this thing. This was a pretty fun little repair project. I, it's my first time ever playing with a rotary phone, and it's my first time ever fixing a rotary phone. Uh, so yeah, this was really cool, and um, I, I gotta say thank you to Alistair, BBC 600, for lending it to me. Now, of course, uh, I was doing him the favor, because the thing had issues that needed to be fixed, but... Uh, uh, I still appreciate him allowing me to give it a chance and, and see if I could uh, repair this thing rather than make it worse. <laughs> Which I think I made it better. It's certainly fully functional now. It might not be cosmetically perfect, but uh, uh, he can use it now and that's what he wanted to do. He has a landline at home and... Uh, he wants to friggin' use this thing, and to that I give a huge thumbs up. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video. I'm going to make an actual uh, telephone call on this thing now. We'll see if, uh, if it works or if I embarrass myself because they can't understand me.
Hi, I'd like to place an order for pickup. Two handheld XL Super Donaires. That's everything. Perfect, thank you. Bye. A Donaire well deserved, I tell you what.